we are going to kick it off. Thank you all of you for being here this morning. We're so excited to have you. Um, I want to say a couple housekeeping things before we kick it off. Um, we are so excited to be here for day three of our Starting a Creative Business series uh, presented by the Arts Alliance Help Desk. And we have some incredible panelists here today, an amazing moderator. We also have ASL interpretation. So I'm going to go ahead and spotlight them um, for folks who need uh, interpretation. You should be able to see them at the side of your screen. Um, we are going to go through uh, really what's more designed to be a conversation and resource sharing uh, from some incredible artists and creatives from all over the state of Illinois. We're going to share a little bit about their experiences, lessons learned, uh, their trials and tribulations, and um, I'm so excited for you to meet all of them today. We also want to hear from you, so I really want to encourage everyone here today to introduce themselves in the chat. Uh, who are you? Where are you from? Um, and what kind of artistic practice uh, you're you're bringing to this space? We also have a Q&A. We have some time for that at the end, but make sure you, throughout the program today, put your questions in that Q&A section. The folks on the panel really want to hear from you and the things you're curious about. Um, just to give a little overview of the day, we're going to um, give you a little 101 about Arts Alliance Illinois and our help desk, which is the program sort of putting on this series, tell you a little bit about ourselves. And we'll really quickly move it on to our panel with our incredible creatives here today. And then again, uh, leave some time at the end for, for Q&A from you all. Um, just to tell you all a little bit about Arts Alliance Illinois, um, we are a statewide advocacy organization that is working to build the power of the creative sector. Um, we have a massive network across all disciplines, across lots of different parts of the state, and we really have a unique role in trying to elevate and lift up the importance of arts and culture um, statewide. Uh, we do a couple of different things. We do advocacy and policy work, as I said. Uh, we do research to try to understand the issues facing the creative sector. And uh, we also do a lot of direct technical assistance and resource sharing. Um, that's where the help desk comes in. That's the part of our org that is uh, putting on this programming throughout this whole week, this month, and this program today. Um, our help desk is sponsored by DCEO, um, which is Illinois's Department of Commerce and Economic Development, which is really trying to invest in the creative sector, make sure it has the resources it needs to thrive. And our help desk is really here for creatives of, again, any discipline across the state to try to connect you all with public funding resources. So that's finding grants, finding money, figuring out how to apply for it. We know that kind of stuff can be confusing, which is why we have staff that can help you walk through that whole process. Um, we also have public programs like this to try to connect artists and creatives with resources out there. We did a program this week that's all about taxes and legal compliance if you're starting a creative business. We had a program last month that's all about lending and loans in the creative sector. And we have some really exciting programs coming up, all of them free, a lot of them virtual. Uh, so stay tuned for more information about upcoming programs from the help desk. Um, I am going to stop sharing my screen and pass it over to Daniel Crane, our moderator for the day, to introduce himself and uh, then get going with our fellow panelists. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, my name is Daniel Crane, uh, and I am the program director for the Center for Creative Entrepreneurship, which is based in Chicago um, in 2112, which is a creative incubator. Um, in Chicago. So this creative incubator uh, originally housed um, music industry um, and now has kind of expanded to general uh, creative industries. So we have um, in-house members who are law firms, insurance companies, record labels, uh, management companies, um, VR, uh, video producing. Uh, so we have lots of different types of companies that come here and we have different spaces within uh, uh, 2112 for shooting video, shooting photography, uh, recording music. So it's kind of a whole little ecosystem um, on its own. Uh, it's a very exciting place. If you ever want to come and tour, uh, we, we love to show people from the creative industries um, our space. So please you know, shoot me an email um, and we'd love to show you. 
Uh, my quick background is I was a full-time musician for 15 years, um, which included teaching at three or four different uh, spaces, um, playing four or five nights a week, touring, recording, doing all the things. Uh, and then I was hired by Navy Pier to build out their cultural programming where I started the Latinx Music Festival, Shy Soul Fest, House Giving, um, and some other things. Um, and I also run a, a video production company that uh, shoots documentaries, does music curation and special projects but this is not about me this is about our wonderful guests today um so i think to get started i would love um for our guests to introduce themselves tell us where you are uh, zooming in from um and give us a little bit of your story and uh, let's start with bill good morning uh my name is bill poss i'm the uh, executive director of poss music works which is located in effingham Illinois, and we're about 200 miles south of Chicago and 100 miles east of St. Louis. Uh, if that gives you some perspective, pretty much right in the south central part of the state. Uh, the area that we serve is basically, if you can imagine, I-74 and south in Illinois. Uh, we don't operate much in the cities um, we, because of the cities already have uh, lots of live music options. We, our, our goal is to bring live music to smaller communities where people don't have to drive to St. Louis or, or Champaign or wherever to go see a show. They can see it in their own hometown. Um, I spent way too much time in college uh, and went on, completed a law degree in 1994, uh, at which point I decided I didn't want to be a lawyer and <laughs> moved to Austin, Texas and started writing songs and working in restaurants and um I basically uh, sold everything I owned in 1996 and moved to the Virgin Islands where I uh, spent the winter sort of woodshedding and getting ready to, to launch my music career. Uh, career, uh, And then I spent the next 15 years or so uh, touring, uh, touring the country and uh, Canada and other countries as well. But um, mostly I was just a homeless guy uh, playing music in, in uh, places all over, uh, small clubs and some festivals. The last four years I spent uh, working with uh, the Fred Eagle Smith Traveling Steam Show, and we actually lived in tour buses and uh, and toured uh, big festivals in the U.S. and Canada, and that was really thrilling part of my career. But um, it all can't, sort of came to an end. My I was touring with my wife and child, and my wife and I got divorced in 2013, uh, and I decided to come off the road. So I had a five-year-old boy and uh, wanted to establish a more, uh, you know, a residence, I guess you'd say. So I've been living here since then, and I didn't have a job or, or any prospects or any money. So I moved in with my mother uh, for the first year or so here, and I decided to start a music festival, which I, you know, when I was driving, touring, I had these, these ideas would, uh, you know, daydreams or whatever would come to my mind and one of the big ones that kept recurring was to start a festival uh, and when I say festival uh, a lot of the festivals that I went to were very big uh, like you know in Montreal or Al uh, in Alberta we went to the Calgary Folk Festival that kind of thing where there's 30,000 people but the really the great festivals that I went to were small like around a thousand or less between 500 and a thousand people because the people all got to know each other over time and kind of became a family. Uh, and this was their family reunion every year, they would get together for a festival. And so I thought that was actually a manageable thing that I could do myself uh, and that I could, the kind of financial risk that I could take myself. So I, uh, so I set out with nothing more than an iPad and uh, almost no money. Um, I started the Moccasin Creek Festival in Effingham at Lake Sarah. I had a friend uh, who had a marina on Lake Sarah and he had built a stage and there was a campground, there is a campground right next door and a free beach just on the other side, um, all within a couple hundred yards of each other. And I asked him if he wanted to try to do a festival and he said he would love that. And uh, so uh, I told him I didn't have, I couldn't pay him any, any rent, but he said that he would take the, the beer sales and the, the booze sales and he'd run the bar and, I would uh, operate the, the the box office and take the tickets, you know, ticket sales and the merchandise and vending money, and that's how uh, that's how we got started. I called a bunch of my musician friends that were that I thought were really really great, 
um, people who were not famous necessarily. Some of them have become famous since then. But um, and I told them I, I can't pay you. Uh, I may not be able to pay you the day of the, the event, but I will pay you eventually. You know me. You trust me. I will do that. And then I tapped into uh, the local community and I reached out, got some sponsors, got a grant from the city, which was a grant that I did not have to be a not for not for profit in order to to qualify for, which I was not a not for profit. So that was very helpful. Um, and uh, most of what most of what needs to be done at a festival, I did myself. I was the MC. I was the backstage hospitality manager. I was the stage manager. Uh, I, uh, you know, I ordered all the merchandise. Uh, I did get a lot of help from friends. Uh, some one of my friends made me a website and designed the, the, the basic graphics that were going to become the advertising uh, graphics for the festival. The poster. Uh, the, the merchandise graphics, all that kind of stuff he helped me with. Uh, I was able to do the social media stuff myself at first. Um, I built a Facebook page and all that uh, Twitter page and stuff. Um, but then I had, you know, a few volunteers, one person manned the, the gate for me. And one, I, I got the Fred Eagle Smith traveling steam show merchandise person to run the merchandise booth for me. She got to take 10%. This is kind of co-oping a lot of the stuff, it, you know, like they they got 10% of the merch sales, but it took that off my plate. So I didn't have to manage, you know, all merchandise for 16 different acts that I had coming to the festival. She did all that. She did all that for me. Um, and I got some free spots on the radio and free spots on, on TV. And I personally went out and did all that. I had, a, I still had a tour bus. Uh, dressed it up with uh, boards that I hung from ropes on the side of the bus. And I just dr drove it around all around uh, central Illinois, different Walmarts and parking lots that I could get permission to put it in. And it became a kind of a rogue advertising campaign. Um, but mostly, uh, mostly the people that came, came from either from this area, Effingham area, or the other half of them came from all over the country because they were people that knew me from my touring years and they trusted that well they knew who all the other performers were because they they had the same taste in music as i did uh and so people came from all over the country uh slowly over time they quit coming from all over the country and they kind of quit coming from effingham but the small cities like champaign bloomington peoria uh st st louis and the metro east area some from indianapolis and then carbondale mount vernon um so sort of the central illinois to Southern Illinois area really is 80% of the patrons now for, for my festivals. In I'll wrap up quickly. In 2017, um, the city passed a, an entertainment tax. And I uh, had been thinking about becoming a not-for-profit. Uh, I also, about that same time, um, it's a long story how this happened, but I ended up with the liquor with the bar myself, which was a lot of work and a lot of risk, but also, also a lot of money. But the person who owned the marina, my friend, decided that he was opening a bar. And so he ended up taking the liquor back from me, which meant a huge hit financially. So I decided I needed another way of making money or bringing money in to the organization. And I established a not-for-profit um, called Posse Music Works. Boss Music Works now, we have four different festivals, a retreat. We do shows throughout the year. We do youth open mics, songwriting workshops, um, lots and lots of stuff for the community, uh, youth, youth entertainment uh, options. Um, and I learned sort of, uh, sort of learning about grant opportunities. And that was, that was a big pivot for me because I had since up to, at the beginning, it was all a for-profit enterprise. When I lost the liquor, I realized I needed a different approach. And so I, I shifted my gears a little bit and I became uh, formed a not-for-profit. And that's what I've been working on since then is trying to learn how to work with organizations like, uh, you know, Southeastern Foundation, Arts Alliance, uh, DCEO. We got a big grant for the first time. It finally got funded last year. 
I learned a lot about uh, what is involved in trying to, um, you know, do all the, all the stuff that uh, they require. Uh, Great. Awesome, Bill. Well, let's, let's, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think um, I definitely have some follow-up questions, but I want to get to other people um, as well. Uh, thank you so much for uh, introducing yourself. Um, let's do uh, Jessica next. There we go. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, you're great. Awesome. Uh, my name is Jessica McGee. I'm better known as an artist as Love Hey Lola, and I am a trash artist. I am also a painter, a sculptor, and I am a sculpturer and a jewelry artist. So some background on me that really influences all of my work is I was a homeless teenager. So I was homeless from about 13 to 18 years old, which means I was also a high school dropout, um, which is a big fun. And I ended up getting my GED and going back to college in my 30s. I got an associate's in biology, and then I went on hiatus <laughs> to open a bar with my husband. That hiatus never really ended. I never did go get my bachelor's degree, but what I did get from my college experience is a deep desire to learn. So I am a, an avid learner and I am very good at self-education, which has influenced my entire career. Um, I ended up becoming a muralist, which if you don't know anything about painting murals, there's a lot of education involved there. So I ended up becoming a muralist and I did a lot of um, nature inspired murals. When I was in college, I was in the Student Association for the Environment. I was the president of the Student Association for the Environment. So environmental work was really um, playing into my life and of course in my work. So I did, I ended up doing a very large mural that was based off of ocean life. And I did a, I painted a very large sea turtle. And I thought to myself that I would love to see a sea turtle in real life because having grown up the way that I did, I didn't really travel. I didn't really see the world. Um, and I happened to have enough money to send myself to Costa Rica. So I did a three week sea turtle conservation trip where I was there for an event called Aribata, which is a mass sea turtle nesting event. So it's thousands and thousands of turtles on the beach at once. And actually um, tourists, visitors aren't allowed. I was working with the Costa Rican government to collect eggs, to put them in hatcheries, measure nest depth. I mean, it was amazing. Um, so I was there for the nesting event, but I was also there for the birth of hundreds of sea turtles, thousands of sea turtles. And to watch sea turtles try to navigate a beach that had vultures everywhere, stray dogs and garbage, like everywhere. The garbage was everywhere, was heartbreaking um, because you see these viral videos online, but to be in the middle of it and to have worked with these creatures, it was just wrong. <laughs> um, but the artist in me loves color. And so I also saw all of the plastic color so it was this weird feeling of what's next. So I ended up bringing a bunch of garbage home with me to, uh, to Peoria, Illinois, where I live, and just started playing with it and manipulating it. I started with sculptures, um, but I've been a jewelry artist for a really long time. And that is <clears throat> something that I have sold through the years. So then I started incorporating it with jewelry and um, both of those things things really started to take off for me. My uh, jewelry sales increased and I'm very much into elevating jewelry as an art. Um, I don't want to just hang pop cans from your ears and call it uh, jewelry, like elevating it so that it was art was really important to me, um, but also installations that people could be a part of and learn more about nature and what humans role in and really our destructive nature with nature. Um, <clears throat> so I make installations and I make jewelry. Uh, in 2000 and I think oh, 20, I asked my husband if he would be on board with me quitting my job and devoting myself full-time to being an artist because my art had always been part-time. And he said, yes. And so we were like, yes, I'm gonna devote myself full-time to being an artist. 
And obviously we got COVID. And so instead I started a nonprofit working with uh, people who live on the street. And I spent the first year of COVID uh, making sure that people had food and clean water and tents because all of our food kitchens had closed down and uh, kind of fell off track of my full-time career as an artist. Um, I ended up getting myself back on track and really dove into full-time artist. And then I got breast cancer. And <laughs> so uh, that really derailed my career. So I shut everything down, um, went through treatments and I am healthy today and cancer-free and, you know, fingers crossed that I remain that way. Uh, but what that taught me was that while I am very good at educating myself about art materials and art techniques and art marketing, I didn't really know anything about business. Um, because if, when I got shut down, my whole business shut down, I didn't have any pillars in place to, to keep things running. So <laughs> once I recovered and I started my business back up, the first thing I did was hire someone to be the boss of me. And she has been wonderful. And she did such great work helping me get focused and learn about business. And I did great work. You know, I dove into podcasts and webinars and we went from $30,000 to a hundred thousand dollars in less than a year. So, um, yeah, that was, that was great. And so now not only do I want to continue to teach myself about business and money because this starving artist idea is uncomfortable. Uh, I, I want other people to learn more about business and money and art and how to make it more of a, a career that is sustainable in every meaning of the word, like financially sustainable, but also, you know, how do you make it sustainable from an environmental perspective? And, uh, yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Jessica. Mm -hmm. um, I look forward to it. Okay. Uh, Shazad or Shami. Thank you, Daniel. Um, yeah, my name is Shazad Chaudhry. Uh, I go by uh, Shami or Shami Sosa is my stage name. Um, born and raised in Chicago. I'm actually speaking from Chicago to you, um, to you all today. Um, yeah, born and raised here in Chicago. Always knew I wanted to live my life in the arts. I didn't really know exactly how that was going to happen uh, at a young age. Um, you know, didn't really come from a background of artists. Uh, my, my, my family kind of wanted me to go the, the medical route. Um, and I did, uh, uh, I got my, uh, um, bachelor's in clinical psychology and I was able to get my master's in public administration. I worked in healthcare for several years, uh, before I, 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 there was a bit of a glass ceiling and it just didn't really inspire me. Um, I was always into music as a kid. I was always into photography and video I was a very visual person. Uh, enjoyed watching films, enjoyed drawing and painting. Um, in fact, uh, uh, being first generation uh, uh, here in America, um, one of my first, um, one of, kind of one of my first, uh, how I found out art really brought people together was in my kindergarten class, I, I pretty much stood out. You know, I was in a class with, with Hispanic and, 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 and uh, um, Polish American uh, students. And I was pretty much the only Pakistani American first generation kid in there. So I, I always kind of stood out uh, in, 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 in grade school um, until, you know, early on, I drew a picture and, and it's a kind of a random story, but I drew a picture of this, uh, of a rabbit kind of doing a Pledge of Allegiance. The teacher loved it so much, she put it up in front of the whole class and the whole class kind of, in a way, ac accepted me. And um, that's how I kind of found out. And this was a really young age, maybe like second or third grade. Um, so at a really young age, I found out how like, art really brought people together and it, it, it you were able to get acceptance through art and really get your, your voice out. So I knew I was always gonna like, you know, somehow live my life in the arts. Um, fast forward, I graduate from school, I'm working in healthcare. Um, and I'm just not happy. Uh, and around 2018, I finally decided to, you know, do my own thing. I left my position as a health uh, administrator, and um, I decided to make my own media company. I knew I always had an eye for marketing. I, I knew I always had an eye for photography. I loved producing music. I had a, you know, active production career on the side where I was just like giving local artists beats. Uh, making beats for myself, uh, working with different rock groups or, 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 or bands, 
like, you know, recording their albums, engineering, all pretty much self-taught. Again, didn't go to school for any of that. Um, fast forward, again, decided to make my own uh, media media company. Uh, we're called Emerald Resources. Uh, we've been uh, we've been around since 2018. You know, I was driving Uber around just to keep the lights on when I first left my career. Um, didn't know what was going to happen. Was 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 uh, didn't know if I made the right decision. But I knew that I had to take the risk uh, because otherwise I I, would, I wouldn't truly be happy with myself. Um, found the right client. That that client worked in mortgage banking, random industry. Uh, they needed help with social media. They needed help with photography. They needed help with their brand. I did really good work for that individual. That opened up many doors for me. Uh, I found out how a lot of different industries are kind of interconnected. So mortgage banking was was connected to real estate, and then real estate was connected to politics because basically, you know, zoning and whatnot. So aldermans. He introduced me to many other individuals. I did good work for them. Word kind of spread, and I was able to build my client base and then start getting financial uh, backing to, to kind of do what I really wanted to do, which was kind of focus on music, focus on production. So I've just been building my resume ever since. Um, currently working on a, a second season of a, of, a, of a TV show called Destination Chicago. Uh, it airs on CBS. So we're filming the second uh, season now. Um, and just always building on myself, working on my network and, uh, you know, participating in even platforms like this where, or I'm in, I'm in a position where I could actually tell my story because it wasn't until like the beginning of this year where I told myself I wanted to do more things like this. I was kind of private with my whole journey, um, but I feel, you know, places like the Art Alliance Illinois just providing this platform and having people from all over the world kind of just check in. Um, it's uh, really an honor to kind of be able to kind of tell any aspect of my story. Awesome. Thank you so much, Shami. Uh, and, you know, it, it's great to hear um, everyone's stories um, and kind of how different they are in the same, uh, you know, in terms of just this workshop being launching your creative business. I want to try to focus really on the business side because um, I think it's it's such a shift when you are, uh, you know, making music or making art or creating and you're creating because it feeds your soul and then you make that that kind of like jump of like, I can actually turn this into, um, into a business to provide for yourself. And I think that also the danger of that can, it can change your relationship with your art, which is another uh, workshop, but we can talk about that uh, at a different time. Um, but I think what would be helpful, and if we could just kind of go down the line, can you give me just two things that you felt, or just tell me the moment where you were like, I, I can actually sustain from this. Like, and, and kind of like, you know, I mean, I think Bill talked about just how resourceful he had to be initially to get the festival, you know, launched. But when was kind of that moment where it was like, oh, wait, I can turn this into a business. And let's actually, uh, let's start with Shami. So I, I suppose the moment it started with me is when I was able to build my client base uh, until about, for about maybe a few. Uh, for my particular industry, it was a it was a subscription based plan for my agency. So mm -hmm. once I was able to get maybe three or four clients on board with a subscription, and I kind of did the math, and I was able to see I was able to pay my rent and have you know some money for food and some free time to kind of focus on other endeavors. Uh, that's when I kind of realized that this may be something that uh, uh, maybe financial financially stable for me when working a 40 hour 40 hour job that just takes up so much of your time and even afterwards you're you're so tired or so unmotivated to do anything else uh with this uh with my own company or my own agency i was able to really be resourceful with my time it wasn't as demanding in terms of hours after physically having to be in a location or having to uh, uh, clock in somewhere so it freed my time up to kind of work on getting more clients or work on my own passions uh, that may eventually lead to some finances down the road. Um, so I want to simply say, I guess when I had more than two clients <laughs> was when I knew, okay, maybe this could work. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then Bill. You're muted. I would tell a, a slightly different story. Um, 
I didn't really come to the conclusion that I could make a living at this. Yeah. Uh, I, I came to the conclusion that I could um, make half a living at mm -hmm. it, but I, I chose to uh, expand the organization uh, and, and pay other people to do parts of it that I wasn't particularly qualified for and all, not all that interested in. Um, and so I make sort of half my living from being the executive director of Posh Music Works. But, the, uh, but what it did was it gave me the opportunity, the, the organization gave me the opportunity to make money um, and gave me the flexibility to make money the way I actually enjoy making money, which is being on stage performing. Um, and so I make most of my, most of my money actually performing. Um, but, but I, like I say, I have a team and that allowed me to, to make, to make this choice that this life, you know, I, I can make a living. Uh, so, but I, maybe to more directly answer your question. No, that's a great answer. <laughs> I think, I think in general for, for, you know, creative entrepreneurs and musicians, because I mean, I'm a musician as well. Like we have to do many things. Like, it's like, what's your business? It's like, well, I have five different things, which is like a gig here, you know, the nonprofit thing here. I think that's very normal, um, you know, in terms of, you know, building a business, right? Like, I don't think we, when we say business, it, it, it's different for us. Like, usually it's a bunch of smaller businesses or smaller things that we have to kind of do. Um, but yeah, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I, I, I think that that answer is great. So I think, I think that another aspect of it was that, that getting to do, having to do what I had to do with, with regard to Post Music Works uh, and establishing the NF and not for profit and all that, it gave me a much more um, professional and organized approach to my own personal career. Mm -hmm. uh, which has helped a lot also. Uh, but the grant, the grant writing has been a big game changer for us. And I, yeah, I need to do more of that. Um, that's, but that's, that's really where I, I think that Post Music Works is stable because of the ability to, uh, to write for grants that, that will help us complete our mission. Great. Awesome. Thanks, Bill. Jessica? Um, so I think when I, I had a job as an event planner, I was working for a catering company. I didn't know anything about it. And I taught myself everything about the industry and increased their profits so much that I was like, why am I putting all of this energy into someone else's business? Um, and that was when I decided to go out on my own. And the arrangement I made with my husband was like, also, we're going to be eating sandwiches for a really long time um, <laughs> because we're going to be broke without my income. So that was the moment that I believed enough in myself to make that step. Um, but as far as like knowing it was a business, you know, it was the opposite. I thought I had a business and then realized I didn't because again, it couldn't survive without me. And I didn't, I didn't have any like financial support things in place. So last year was the first year I was really like, okay, <laughs> we have money in the bank and I have a team that can, you know, if I go down, they can do things. Um, but it was, it was really last year and it was really due to me being like, these are the things you're not good at. And so start off with literally like $60 a week and payroll for somebody else to work three hours and just help me start. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, I, I think also just for the audience and, and maybe we could just bring everyone uh, pinned um, just so I, I'm not like, um, yeah, there's everybody. Um, what I'd love to hear from you and I, I you know, uh, is, is not necessarily like advice because I think everyone's kind of story is different, but in terms of like, um, you know, when or people are starting wanting to start a music festival or wanting to kind of grow their creative career, you know, can you give me one, uh, you know, one or two things that you felt really helped kind of propel you into that, uh, into that position? And it could be anything from like, you know, obviously grants or a network or hiring a team or, you know, quitting your job and going full time, but just what you feel like for you was just a, a big turning point um you know uh when when 
jumping into your business, like a resource or uh, that, that really helped you? Uh, let's start with uh, uh, Jessica. Yeah, uh, back, for me, it was, <laughs> it was hiring that team. Mm -hmm. And as a person who has taught myself how to do absolutely everything for so long, I was super resistant to hiring a team because I'm like, no, I can do that. I'm going to save money and do everything myself. And I didn't realize that that mindset was, it's good, but it was also hurting me a little bit. Um, so really sitting down and realizing, okay, take this small amount of money and hire somebody just for three hours a week. Like, like, because I think I thought like, I've got to hire somebody part-time or full-time mm -hmm. to take it all on. And it was really, it started off with three hours a week. And then, you know, we bumped that up as she basically paid for herself because she increased our revenue. And then we were able to bring another member on who also pays for herself because she increased her revenue. So I think being a little bit like you can't do everything yourself. And sometimes it's just not, you think you're being smart and you're actually not. So I was actually yeah. harming myself by trying to do absolutely everything. Yeah, I think that's great. Uh, Shami? Uh, um, so I guess for me, what, what kind of, I don't want to say propelled me, but made me realize that this is something that's real is when I first created that LLC. And when I first started, uh, when I first built my website, and this was actually something that was real and was tangible. Before that, I was just kind of a kid with a camera or a kid working behind a, a, a mixing board or a person uh, that was um, helping with social media. Didn't really interface myself with any company or agency or really didn't brand myself as well. I think brand was once I was able to brand myself and able to put um, uh, my information out there in a professional way, having uh, an email uh, address with my company in the back, you know, in the, in the end of it, all these things to kind of build my uh, trust within the industry, the mm -hmm. trust with my audience, uh, as well as the trust with my future clientele. I feel like those boxes needed to be checked. And it wasn't until I actually officially did those things uh, until I was act uh, until I realized that this was a serious thing. That's great. Bill? Well, I'll tell you a funny story um, about getting started that that taught me that I, both that I needed to be flexible and that I could be. Uh, about two months into the deal that I made with the, the venue owner to, you know, to have the festival at his venue, you know, he had, he had agreed to take the booze and I had agreed to take the gate. And that was sort of, you know, we didn't pay, no money passed between us, right? About two months in, he saw our ticket, our ticket link. And so he checked it out and he's, he called me up on the phone and started yelling. He's like, no, Bill, no one is going to pay $50 in advance, $60 at the gate to come to this festival. And I was like, well, I think they will, you know, that's, that's, that's actually a really pretty inexpensive price for a three day music festival. Um, and he was like, no one is going to do it. No one's going to buy those tickets and you need to either lower your price or something. And I, I said, it's too late for that. I mean, we're already up and running and, and, uh, and I, I, there's no way I can pay the artists and pay the sound company and whoever else needs to get paid in, 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 at a lower price. This is low as I can go. And he said, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go get a bar license, uh, for that because, uh, I just don't think anybody's going to be there. And he was a lot of money that he was going to be risking, you know? So I said, I said, well, do you mind if I run the bar then? And he said, he said, cause I had to have a bar. So he said, no, go ahead, uh, you know, but no one's coming to your festival. And he didn't know, I, he didn't ask me, but I had already sold like $5,000 worth of tickets. Um, he just, he just didn't know that. And he, he, he knew his own, his own perspective in a small town in Illinois and a bunch of artists that nobody's ever heard of. Uh, and so, but it, 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 I only had like about 60 days to get everything in order, which meant I had to get a license i had to get insurance i had to get uh, you know i had to do all this i had driving back and forth to springfield and stuff anyway at the end of the day i probably broke even at the gate but i made all the money i made really was from the merchandise but mainly from the bar and it and it had it has gone back and forth it's something is different every year 
but it's almost always ends up being uh, less of a burden and more of an opportunity. Yeah, that's, that's great, Bill. Um, I think uh, I'd love to, I'm going to open up to a Q and a and Jessica, there's a bunch of, uh, not a bunch, but there's like two questions basically of like how you found somebody, uh, you know, to work, to work for you. Um, what was that process like? And you know, maybe what were some of the tasks? Um, yeah. I think that's a big issue in general in terms of like, hey, I want to grow my team. Where do I look, um, you know, to bring someone on to work three hours a week or. You know. <laughs> yeah, uh, I have a pretty strong social media presence. So that's I put it out there first. And I tend to be a little sarcastic online. So it was it was aligned with my brand to put out a message that said, Hey, I need somebody to come be the boss of me. Is anybody willing? And, um, and I didn't want it to be a friend because I don't need a friend to be the boss of me. I need somebody that's a little bit removed. So it was an acquaintance of mine and she, I vend at a art and farmer's market, um, during the summer and she showed up at my booth and she was like, I can be the boss of you. And I was like, I don't think that you can, because I'm that chaotic artist that is like, squirrel all the time. So, um, but she's like, no, I, I can be the boss of you. She has a, a full-time job. She does logistics for a pretty big company. And so she came in and she was like, you need to do this. You need to do this. You need to do that. And every week she just kind of hears me <laughs> that like she pulls me back. Um, so she was fantastic. She set sales goals. She spent time looking at our numbers, which is something that I kind of just zone out. It's not my, my strong point. Um, so yeah, I just put it out there. I mean, I just, I just put it out there. And again, thankfully I have that, that strong social media presence, which means it went out to a lot of people. Um, and that's how I ended up getting the second member of my team who also is, is great. And I will say the first time that I put it out there, I had a few people come out and say that, you know, they could work for me. The second time I put it out there when I was hiring somebody else, I had so many applications, I didn't even know what to do with them. So. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, and I think, uh, you know, what, what Bill was talking about as well of, you know, as creative, sometimes we have to create the own, our own space for what we want to do. Um, and that usually takes uh, some risk um, but can have reward. Like I have a similar story with Bill where I used to play in nightclubs and get paid nothing with a three band bill and just be like, I don't understand like how the place is packed and, you know, a band is splitting a hundred dollars, uh, each band. It's like, this doesn't make any sense. So, you know, I created my own events and, you know, took the bar and took the door and it was like, Oh, actually there is money to be made. It's just that, um, you know, I have to then get the insurance and the security and the licensing. I have to be willing to put in the extra work, but by creating my own space, I really get to see what the business is like. I really get to see where the money is and where it's not. And I think that's a, you know, an important, um, an important step. Um, and in terms of, uh, I think what Shami said too, with, you know, creating a website and having an LLC and, and preparing yourself for those ser more serious conversations is a very important step. Uh, in trying to, you know, grow a business or, or a client base. Um, having something that's legitimate online is absolutely essential and that you have uh, some sort of business. I would not suggest, you know, launching it into as self-employed um, if possible because, um, and I'm not a lawyer nor a tax person, mm -hmm. but with taxes, it's not going to look good. So, um, you know, definitely if you're thinking about a creative business, you know, talk to a lawyer, um, or talk to an accountant about starting an LLC or an S corp or whatever seems to fit your business best. Um, but that's, that's a really important part. Um, so we are, uh, you know, about 10 minutes out. Um, we have another question says Chicago is a very expensive place to live. Does living in another place help? <laughs> I want to say, yes, Chicago is very expensive. Um, and uh, you know, I think there's something that's amazing about, uh, the fact that, and my guest can answer this, if you have the internet um, and you're happy where you're at, then you, you can tap into a lot. Um, you know, technology has given us access um, to our friends and to people and to things we don't know about. So 
you know, I think location is important to a certain degree. I mean, obviously getting FaceTime with people and, and building a network and, you know, having meeting places is important, but I don't necessarily think that you have to be in Chicago to build a creative career, but I'd love to hear from, you know, obviously Jessica and Bill, their thoughts because they are the non-Chicago people on the call. So. Um, I can say that, uh, so I live in Peoria, which is about two and a half hours south of Chicago. And uh, I have customers all over the world. We uh, ship globally. And I also spend anywhere from one to two months of the year in California, which my job pays for. And I work while I'm there. Um, I'm judging a trash and fashion show in Chicago, in Chicago in July. So I'll actually be heading up there for that. Um, but the cost of living here is fantastic. Um, my studio is in an old bar and, and the rent is dirt cheap and it, you know, yeah, it's not a major city, but a lot of the time that I spend in California is in Los Angeles and people pay so much money to live there. And I love that I still get to enjoy that. Um, but then I come back here and our summers here are great. And I love my studio and I love my local network. So yeah, the internet has opened that up and building my business has also opened up more of the world. So no, I don't mind living down here at all. Great. Bill? Uh, am I on? Yep. Uh, so I chose to live here because my family was here. Um, and when, when in terms of how that relates to my my location relates to my business i mean it, it, it was because of the location that i was able to do what i did because we're, we're interstate 70 and 57 cross here and there's about five u.s highways amtrak goes through here um and while while it's more expensive than being essentially homeless by choice which i was for 15 years it's uh incredibly cheap uh and i I mean, the idea of living in Chicago, I can't even fathom what that would, I mean, when I say I make a living, I couldn't live on what I make in Chicago. Right. We're not in Peoria either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think for, uh, for me, it's always just about like, you know, there's the, the business and there's also like what brings you joy, you know, uh, what space is going to inspire you and, and, you know, and family's important and whatever is important to you, I think is a, you know, something to think about when, when building it. Go ahead, Bill. I'm also, I'm also a folk singer who's interested in songwriting and uh, the music that I create is no more popular in Chicago than it is in Effingham. Um, there's just a lot more people there. Uh, so, so it makes, it fits my, my style, I guess you'd say, and the style of music that I present at my festivals, bluegrass and country and, and uh, Americana music. Great. I think that, um, I'm going to ask this question to Shami. Uh, any advice on finding your first uh, few clients? Are there specific marketing strategies that you found particularly effective? Um, I mean, I can really tell what my personal experience was. Uh, I mean, I did learn a few things along the way. Um, but with my personal experience, it was basically being able to deliver quality work um, to that initial client. A lot of my business spread through word of mouth. Uh, I was luckily, luckily, luckily enough to be in again, like in an industry that was, or representing an industry that was intertwined with a few others. Uh, and I learned how industries all uh, uh, basically kind of piggybacked off each other as well, and how the networking was so important. Um, was your first client? How did you find your first client? Was it in your network already, or was it like? A friend of mine couldn't make a gig for a video shoot, said, hey, Shami, I can't make it. Do you want to do it? Uh, I didn't really know that much about cameras. I had I, I, I kept I kept up with it. I knew how to operate a camera. I would I wouldn't call myself a photographer at that point. I would not call myself a videographer at that point. But I knew it was a good opportunity. I needed the money. And um, uh, uh, I was able to, again, meet this individual. Um, and then when I basically when I when when I went back, I, I practiced and I refined some of those skills in terms of what the client was looking for. Um, it was a learning process along the way. Um, but again, luckily, I had years of 
prior experience too with with camera work or with production that kind of helped me refine those skills and present something that was uh, presentable. Um, obviously, I've gotten a lot better since then. That was 2018. Um, but just delivering quality work, communication with that client was very important. Sometimes I did feel like I was underpaid, but I knew in the longer game, uh, it, it would uh, it would work out for me because I was building my network. And I also had to identify when it was time to know my worth and kind of grow and even move on to to other clients and other industries. I always remembering what uh, what the doors that were open open for me, but also remembering that I, I wasn't going to put myself in a box. And just because someone opened doors for me, it was my skill set that kept me in that room. Yeah. It's great, Shaman. I think this will be the, probably the final uh, question. Um, what resources uh, did you use to start your business, um, like from the state, from DCO, or other resources? And so that's the first question. What resources did you use? Um, and then what resources do you wish were more, uh, more available um, for your own work? And let's start with Jessica. Um, what resources did I use to start my work? Yep, start. And then what yeah. resources you wish were available? Uh, so I started self-funding. So waitressing and all the tips go into a jar and you just fund yourself. Um, and so I was self-funded for, for forever. Um, what resources do I wish that I would have had available to me? I think I wish that I would have had more business help. I um, have, we have an art department at a private university here. And I had a lot of friends who were getting their masters in fine art. And I always asked them, like, do they teach you about business? And across the board, they said, no, they didn't. And so, um, you know, I'm seeing so many more like you guys included the Arts Alliance um, offering business help to artists. And I wish I would have had that because I know when I was asking for help, when I first started out, People were always like, well, take a class from this potter or take a class from this painter. But there was no, no one was talking about the business side of it. And so, you know, the resources that I wished for, I'm glad are popping up all over the place. I'm glad that you guys are doing this panel because this is a resource. Great. Thanks, Jessica. Bill? Uh, I was uh, overwhelmed by the resources that that came to me when I started, uh, but a part of that was being willing to ask. Um, and I I asked every place I could in town. I got free hotel rooms for the bands. I got uh, people uh, donated foods in some cases for the for the green rooms. People individually uh, reached out and asked how they could help. And so I, I have no, I mean, the, the, the one thing I've already said, which is that I, I was not qualified to to uh, apply for grants that were only available to not-for-profit arts organizations. And I changed that. So I got what I wanted. Um, but yeah, uh, I have, I don't really have a great answer to that because I did get those resources, but asking for them. And then that, that's where, that's where living in a small town probably makes a huge difference is uh, that people were, they knew my name. They maybe knew me growing up or whatever. So when I came back, they were interested in helping. That's great. Thanks, Bill. Shami? Um, just to piggyback off what Bill said, I think Bill brought up a really good point about asking. You know, in terms of resources, the internet is here. There are so many different resources that we could uh we could that are that are that are available to us. We just have to be searching in the right places and actually know what it is that we want to do. Sometimes as entrepreneurs or as public figures or artists, we're so confused on what we want to do, or we may be doing too many things. Uh, but being able to ask, uh, I think there's a there's a great humbleness in that, and you really never know what will come out of it. You know, there's a saying, closed mouths don't get fed. And I think that's really true. Um, and swallowing your pride, being able to ask questions, being able to ask some favors, but at the same time, you have to have something going for you as well. Otherwise, it may seem like you're just kind of asking for something. And people tend, things need to be a win-win situation. And you, you, by understanding that, you can kind of help your approach when it comes to business or, or even personal life as well. Um, so in terms of resources, 
I think with, you know, with so much literature, media, YouTube, places like 2112 that I'm a member of, um, and, you know, the Arts Alliance Illinois as well, uh, platforms like this, nonprofits for like this, we just have to be willing to take the time out and search for these resources and be motivated. It's really hard nowadays to stay motivated. Um, there's a lot of distractions and knowing when to kind of eliminate those distractions, whether it's cell phone use, whether it's friends, whether it's going out and really being able to buckle down and understand that this is something you really want to do is very important. Um, and carving that time out to resource, research these resources is a very, very important. But again, I think Bill brought up an excellent point ask being able to ask he was able to get free hotel rooms out of it he was able to get free free uh, you know free food out of it but i think bill had something going for him as well he had something that he built that people could respect so when they see something they can respect they're going to want to help it yeah that's great um thanks shami and i think uh from my perspective you know, I graduated school. I became a full-time musician in Chicago. I was selling them in shoes at Marshall Fields. I had literally no idea um, how to build a music career. I mean, it was just like, I just said yes to gigs and that was it. Like there was nothing of like, um, you know, starting an LLC or organizing taxes. I mean, you know, there was really no resources. Um, and so I, I think for me, I, I wish um, at that point that there were more resources. I think it's important, uh, you know, right now that wherever you are to find like-minded people, whether it's online or in person, that can be your support and can be your network in terms of bouncing ideas off of um, and, um, you know, uh, that's for, for me how I was able to build my career was my network. I said yes to every gig, so I played in house music uh, settings, I played in hip hop settings, I played in rock settings, I played Sweet Caroline for wedding bands. I, you know, I did the whole the whole thing. And, and from that network, I was able to build a career. Um, so I think it's really important as much as possible to, you know, expand yourself. And in terms of like resources, there are grants out there. I was so shocked when I worked for Navy Pier that there was grants for arts. Like I was like, what are you talking about? There's thousands of dollars uh, to fund art projects. I mean, it was just like mind blowing for me. Um, so um, you, if you go to our website, ccglobal.org and Arts Alliance Illinois, there's a bunch of, um, I know, grants. They, they are really good about sharing opportunities. Uh, so I think it's really important to, to know, um, you know what's out there um, for you. But again, uh, I just want to thank our guests, uh, Jessica and Bill and Shami, um, for an incredible conversation. It's inspiring to hear um, about all of your stories, I'm going to check all of you guys out after this call, especially, um, you know, just sounds so interesting with what you guys are doing. Um, it's great to hear about what different creatives in Illinois are doing. And I, I think Arts Alliance has really uh, been, excuse my French, kicking ass at connecting um, Illinois creatives together and building really important resources for us to share these stories. Um, so big shout out to the Arts Alliance team uh, for curating this and putting this together. I don't know if they have any final uh, words, um, but uh, again, thanks to everyone for coming and asking great questions. Um, and I know that you can follow up uh, with, people are putting stuff in the chat, so you can follow up with anyone you wanna to talk to um, in the chat. But thanks again. Thank you so much, Daniel. And thank you to our incredible panelists. Uh, we're so appreciative of everyone's time today and all the stories in the chat. I wanna make sure people know that they can visit our website at Arts Alliance to get access to some of those resources like upcoming grants, like one-on-one -on -one support to help people walk through, I don't understand where my tax forms are for this, or I don't understand if I qualify for this. That's why our help desk is here. So I'll drop a link to that in just a second. I also want to plug that we have more conversations and workshops and panels where you can hear from experts and fellow creatives like you who are navigating this world, trying to make it work. Um, so I'll put a link to our next series, which is coming up, which is really focused on that nonprofit side. I know Bill talked a little bit about that. And, and as to Jessica, just what does it mean to be someone who's in the business world and also thinking about the nonprofit world? Similar, but often very different concerns, right, from a legal and tax perspective. So we'll have some artists and creatives um, who are talking in two weeks about the process of starting a creative nonprofit.
What are some of the concerns there? What are some of the things you need to know? Um, we're excited to hear some feedback from you all about what are the things you want some more of? What are the kinds of panels and conversations you want us to do in the future? So stay tuned for some opportunities as well to give your feedback. We really want to hear from you. And again, make sure to come visit us at support.artsalliance.org. Uh, if you have a question about grants, about some one-on-one -on -one support, we would love to have you bring your questions, bring your thoughts there. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Have a wonderful rest of your day and hope to see you on another panel or workshop sometime soon. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Take care.